Agar for opening up his house, even though we had barely met previously. And Jane, who I've luckily gotten to know extremely well uh, recently, uh, it's um, really an honor to be, after all the great parties that two of you have hosted over the years, uh, to be here is, is a tremendous honor. And Art and Aaron, uh, thank you very much for your work in co-hosting and for kind of both of you taking me under your wing uh, in my first run for uh, public office. And of course, uh, for Mike, uh, you know, I, I just can't tell you. I, uh, Carr and I first met when we were freshmen in college, 17 years old, and uh, they took me into their family right from the beginning. So I've really had two families heavily involved in democratic politics my whole life and tremendous role models. So thank you, Mike. Um, He's actually here because it's Nora, my younger sixth birthday party this weekend. So Mike and Kitty always come up for the birthday party every year. And uh, so we wanted to do something around that. So thank you all very much. I also want to briefly just thank a couple of uh, some of the other co-hosts, some of whom are here, a few of whom are not. Uh, Supervisor John Avalos and Supervisor Carmen Chu, unable to be here, but hosting and very supportive. Uh, Democratic County Central Committee member Rafael Mandelman, uh, Peter Keene, Ann Kirk and Ed Sykes. Nancy Oliveira and Michael and Johanna Wall. Thank you all very much. And I know lots of other people like Eileen there at the front and many others have put a lot of time and effort in to make this happen. And thanks for all of you for coming out uh, on a Saturday. So uh, I'm running for district attorney to make San Francisco the safest and fairest city in the country. And so it kind of alludes to exactly what Michael said. And I'm going to do that in two ways. One, by building collaborations. And number two, by doing what works. And both of those things sound very straightforward, but unfortunately, in public safety policy, they're quite rare. So I want to give you uh, a little bit of background and examples of both of them, and then I'll take some questions. First of all, on collaboration. As some of you know, I've spent my career looking at public safety from every possible angle. I've been working here for 20 years on different public safety issues, starting with different nonprofits in town. My very first job was at Walden House Adolescent Facility, counseling delinquent kids. After law school at Stanford, my first job was working at Legal Services for Children, representing low-income kids with their legal problems. Later, I moved over to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, uh, and later was appointed to the Police Commission, and started working very closely with law enforcement for the first time. At the Mayor's Office, we coordinated with the Sheriff's Department, the DA, probation, the Police Department, and then on the Police Commission, as many of you know, it's the civilian oversight body of the Police Department, so I oversaw policy for the department as well as cases of officer misconduct. What I wanted to do was find a way to combine all of that in one place, and I got that opportunity at Berkeley Law School, which was starting a new center and asked me to be their first executive director, the Berkeley Center for Criminal Justice at Bolt Law School. And the vision I had for it, the mission when I started the center, was really what the mission of my whole career has been and the mission of this campaign has been, which is to bring law enforcement and community together to work collaboratively on pragmatic criminal justice solutions. And, I, and so I went over to Berkeley to do that, and I want to give you an example of one, uh, one issue where I did that, which is helping people come out of prison get jobs. If you think about it, there's no reason that law enforcement should have as much as a vested interest in this as people on the community and advocacy side. I went to a uh, strategy session right when I started at the center uh, of various uh, advocates from the ACLU and legal services and the public defender's office, formerly incarcerated advocates, talking about how we can improve policies for people coming out of prison. And I felt the need to say to them, um, you're doing great work, but you're really preaching to the choir. You need to have law enforcement at the table to make the kind of changes you're talking about. And I thought I might get booed out of the room, but in fact, at the break, numerous people came up to me and said, you're exactly right. We know we need to work with law enforcement. We know we need them at the table. We just have no idea how to do that. Can you help us? And I said, you know, I actually just started a center whose goal is to do exactly that. And so that became our very first project, thanks to Ben Jealous, who was then head of the Rosenberg Foundation, has now since gone on to be the president and CEO of the NAACP nationally, and is really pushing these issues on a national basis in a terrific way. Ben and I sat down and mapped out this most unusual project that was going to bring together the most unlikely of allies around this issue to work together and um, address the issue. We had the head of the prison guards union, and for those of you who have followed criminal justice policy, they have been the biggest impediment to just even rational criminal justice policies in this state for decades. Uh, we had a Republican uh, DA uh, from San Diego, Bonnie Dumanis, and we had other law enforcement officials from up and down the state. Then we also had a lot of community and advocacy leaders, formerly incarcerated advocates, the National Employment uh, Law Center, uh, which does a lot of work in this area. And then we had 
uh, we we also had a lot of the employers who actually hire folks because they need to be at the table. So Goodwill Industries that has great rehabilitation programs here for people coming out of prison. Debbie Alvarez was on there. Uh, we had this recycling company in Fresno that's very profitable and hires only ex-offenders. So they're doing social justice while doing very well. These are the folks we had around the table. And I was facilitating. We were going to have three meetings over the course of a year to come up with what we could agree on. And the very first meeting, I walked in, and the head of the prison guard union was sitting right across from this very uh, intense, formerly incarcerated advocate. And I looked at both of them, and I said, oh, my goodness, this is going to be a very long day. And in fact, the first hour was a little tough. People really had to get stuff off of their chest. But once they'd done that, just as I expected, people saw the commonalities. And very quickly, we were all on the same page and saw that this was an issue that law enforcement cares about and the community cares about. Because if you're a police chief, would you rather have someone coming back to your community who has no job, is not sure how they're going to spend their day the first day out of prison, or how they're going to support their family, that's a public safety problem. Having someone in a job who can wake up and go to work and support their family, of course law enforcement's going to be behind that. So we were able to get um, an incredible consensus from all these folks who signed on to a report where no matter who you are in the state, whether you're Republican or Democrat, Northern California, Southern California, a law enforcement person or community person, you're going to see several names on that list of folks you trust who came up with these recommendations. And so that's exactly the approach I'm going to take to the district attorney's office. For tough issues, let's bring everyone around the table and let's see how we can, how I, with my ties in both the law enforcement community and the advocacy community, can bring people together to come up with pragmatic, common sense reforms. That's the way I've done things my whole career and the way I'll do them in the DA's office. Now, a big part of building collaboration with the community is building trust with the community. And it's incumbent on law enforcement to be proactive in reaching out to the community and building that trust. In a lot of communities, particularly low-income communities of color, for very good reasons, there is a lack of trust in law enforcement in this city just like in any city. And so we need to be very proactive. And unfortunately, a few things that have happened in the district attorney's office in the last couple of weeks I think have been had a very negative effect on building that trust. One of them is uh, the district attorney's office was asked to release records on officer-involved shootings. And every officer-involved shooting, the DA's office investigates to see whether the officer, what they did was legal or illegal. The vast majority of the time, in fact, they find that it was lawful use of force. And many counties, such as San Diego, a conservative county with a Republican DA, release these records publicly. San Diego even has them on their website a very publicly accessible document explaining to the community what happened in the shooting and why the DA did not press charges. When I was on the police commission, we would get briefed on these cases in closed session, so I would have a good sense of what happened, but the public generally did not know. And there were always rumors and different things spreading through the community that often were inaccurate about what had actually happened. Well, unfortunately, when this district attorney's office got this public records request, their response was, we don't keep these records, and even if we did, uh, we're under no obligation to release them to you. And I just think that is absolutely the wrong approach. I vow to have the most open and transparent district attorney's office in the country and absolutely would not only respond to public records requests with, with reports on officer-involved shootings, we'll put them on the website so they're publicly available to everyone the minute they come out. So open, transparent DA's office is the key to building the trust, to building collaboration. Another way to building trust is conflicting yourself out when you have a conflict, which I will clearly do. Many of you may have heard in the last few days about the scandals in the San Francisco Police Department. And the current DA, as many of you may know, recently appointed by the mayor to fill the rest of Kamala Harris's term, and I know many of you worked with me to help get Kamala elected as Attorney General, um, is our former police chief. Now this has never happened, not only in the history of San Francisco, in the history of our country that a sitting police chief has become the district attorney. And there are all kinds of problems with that, and they're showing up in the paper every day. <clears throat> Conduct that officers did when our current DA was chief is now being investigated, or until yesterday, uh, by our district attorney. So he's investigating incidents that happened on his watch in the police department. It's a very clear conflict. He said there's no conflict and I can investigate this. I put out a very strong call saying you have to conflict yourself out. This is absolutely the perception and the reality is that it's a hopeless conflict. And almost every legal or ethical scholar you can think of weighed in in the same direction. In fact, before I put my statement out, I checked with five senior people in law enforcement who I really trust. The word they all used to me was no-brainer. It's a no-brainer that you conflict yourself out. He refused to do so. Just yesterday, however, he said he is going to pass it on to the Attorney General's office. 
though he said it's not because of a conflict, it's for other reasons. So I don't know, this just happened late on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I'll let you judge uh, what really happened there, I don't know. But the bottom line is he dug in his heels and said no conflict. If there's even the perception that I'm conflicted in any way, I'll conflict myself out right away because we need the public to feel that the DA's office is being fair with everyone that it is working with and everyone that it is investigating. So that is the building collaborations and building trust part. Let me talk about what works for a moment. Unfortunately, in public safety, we really have not been following what the research shows clearly works. Public safety policy, and unfortunately we saw this in 1988, uh, is led by fear, by political opportunism, and it is not based on what actually works. Everyone is worried about being soft on crime and isn't focusing on the facts. So uh, I want to give an example of something that does work that I was involved with in the mayor's office. Uh, in the middle of the last decade, you'll remember homicides jumped very high in San Francisco, close to 100 for several years in a row. And so as someone who had a, a national expertise on this, I was asked in the mayor's office to look into what things we, that are working elsewhere we could possibly bring here. And one of those... Uh, is hot spots policing, which is a very, very simple strategy. You look at the data and you put the cops on the dots in the hot spots. We had one problem here. We did not have any real-time data on what was happening on our streets. Our data system was so abysmal five years ago, it was an absolute embarrassment being up the road from Silicon Valley, unable to look at our crime data in real time. So I was able to get a grant to get the leading expert from Harvard University to come out here and do a study on violence in San Francisco because we couldn't do it ourselves. And what he found was pretty astonishing. Over 50% of the shootings and homicides in San Francisco occur in less than 2% of the landmass of this city. Violence is so highly concentrated here, and the solution to that, from a law enforcement and community perspective, was pretty obvious. As I moved into the police commission, we helped develop a strategy called the Violence Reduction Initiative that divided that 2% into five zones, the Western Edition, the Mission, Bayview, Sunnydale, and Tenderloin, and we flooded both police and community resources to those five areas, to those hot spots. The result, in, in 2009, we had the biggest drop in the country of homicides, over a 50% drop to our lowest total since the 1960s. The following year, 2010, we kept it at that very, very low level. We won an award from the Justice Department in Washington, their prestigious Project Safe Neighborhoods Award, and many of you have followed law enforcement in this town for a long time. Um, we've never been nominated for an award before, much less won, so it was an, an incredible accomplishment uh, for us. That's the kind of very straightforward approach. It's not rocket science, but we haven't been doing these things here, and we need to bring those kinds of approaches here. Let me talk about another way I look at a problem of what works. Mm -hmm. The death penalty does not work, and I will not seek the death penalty in San Francisco. <laughs> now, let me tell you why. I look at policy decisions really through three prisms. Does it make us safer? Is it cost effective? And is it fair and equitable? The death penalty fails miserably on all three fronts. It's a no-brainer that we should not be using it here. It does not make us safer. My colleagues at, Cal at Berkeley have done studies showing it has no deterrent effect, no increase in public safety whatsoever. It doesn't make us safer. It doesn't work. Let's look at cost. Right now, in our state budget, while we are laying off, you know, while teachers are getting pink slips, while Oakland and other cities are laying off police officers, while social services are being decimated, there is still almost $400 million in the budget to rebuild death row in San Quentin. It's still in the budget. That's crazy. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. It costs about $90,000 a year more for each person who is incarcerated on death row than if they were in prison for life without the possibility of parole. So it's incredibly expensive, it doesn't work, and it's not fair and equitable. All the studies show that if you're a person of color, you're far more likely to get